is ordinary until you see the core side of it. And what you're looking for is a story behind the news. We bring it to you from Lagos, the commercial capital of Nigeria. Giving you all sides and political stories round the clock. Every detail from the start line to the final whistle. Core TV News, expanding your view. Good morning again. I am Shay Martins. This is Core TV News on the hour. President Goodluck Jonathan has assured parents of the kidnapped Chibok schoolgirls that they will be brought back alive. This was part of the promises he personally made during a long drawn meeting with the parents and about 50 girls who escaped from insurgents. These are the girls who escaped on the day Boko Haram insurgents stormed their school in April this year. One after the other, they filed into the presidential villa for a meeting with President Jonathan. They were accompanied by some of the parents of their colleagues who have spent more than three months in captivity. A handful of cabinet members joined the president as well as the governors of Borno and Bauche state. Journalists were barred from the meeting which lasted more than five hours. So it was left to the presidential spokesman to give an insight into what he described as a frank session. The president reassured them of the federal government's determination and his personal determination to ensure that the girls that are still in captivity are brought out alive. He made it clear that that is the main objective of the government. Mr. President also used the opportunity to empathize with the parents, with the girls, and to reassure them that everything will be done uh, to make things easier for them, particularly the ones that have already escaped and the ones that will also be rescued. Mr. President assured them that their education will not in any way suffer, and that after all of this has had a happy ending, because he believes, he is convinced that evil we never prevail over good. Some of the ministers who were in the meeting are also convinced that the Chibok girls will soon be reunited with their parents and colleagues. To some of the girls that were able to escape from Sambisa forest, or those of them that escaped even on the first day they were abducted. And I think the parents were happy to have listened to Mr. President. Uh, assuring them of the commitment of government, assuring them of the determination of government to rescue the abducted girls, and in particular assuring those of them that are now home with their parents on the continuation of their education and continued protection of lives and properties in those communities. Yeah, essentially, the, the, the expectation of the average Nigerian is the release of the girls. But there must be foundations for the release of these girls. While this thing cannot be done almost immediately, uh, while efforts are being put in place, there is equally a need for Mr. President to reassure the people that are directly involved are Nigerians that government is doing everything that is necessary to release these girls. And I can assure you that from various reports that are coming in, and Mr. President knows much more than any other person knows in this country about this situation. The release of these girls will be a matter of time. One of the governors also provided a different perspective. What the presidency uh, was aware of was certainly yes, uh, uh, the insurgents have gone into the school, uh, gone into the village, picked students and picked some, 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 some women too. So to say that uh, it is belated, that the government didn't know about it until now, I think that is very unfair. Rushing to, you know, uh, rescue them might lead to, you know, some casualties, which is why government is taking time, uh, going solo, solo, so that by the grace of God, we we'll get all the girls in peace, not in pieces. More than 200 people attended the meeting from Chibok, including 51 of the 57 girls who escaped from insurgents. 
but none of them was prepared to share details of their interaction with the president. The Girls' Movement has scheduled a number of events to commemorate the 100th day of the abduction of hundreds of schoolgirls from Chibok in Borono State. This, according to the group, is to amplify the voices of its members in demanding that the girls be brought home now and alive. A statement issued by the protest movement indicates that a press briefing will be held in Ibadan at 10 a.m., followed by a special sit-out ceremony at the Unity Fountain in Abuja at 3 p.m. In Lagos, the group has slated a remembrance service at the Wall of Missing Girls at Falom Roundabout at 4 p.m as well as a candlelight vigil of the Nigerian consulate in New York at 5.30 p.m. It added that there will also be events in India, Pakistan, the UK, and many world capitals in partnership with the UN Special Envoy's Office of Gordon Brown. An associate fellow of the Henry Jackson Society and Jamestown Foundation, Jacob Zen, says former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton misled President Barack Obama on the enormity of the threat of Boko Haram. The situation, he says, stopped America from coming to Nigeria's aid before the insurgency got out of hand. Zen made this allegation in his report exposing and defeating Boko Haram, why the West must unite to help Nigeria defeat terrorism, which was released by the Bo Group on Tuesday. Zen says Boko Haram, which has killed thousands of people this year alone, was not labeled a foreign terrorist organization for a long time. And this allowed the group to access finances almost unimpeded for the first four years of its insurgency. Clinton was Secretary of State from 2009, the year Boko Haram started its bombing campaign till 2013, when the crisis had virtually gone out of hand. The U.S. only labeled Boko Haram and its offshoot Ansaru as a terrorist on November 13, 2013, after Clinton's departure from office, making it a crime for Americans to provide material support to the group and enabling banks to freeze U.S. assets of the terrorists. Zen claimed that the U.S. State Department led by Clinton did not label Boko Haram and its offshoots because of her team's political interest and misguided theories about terrorism. He further alleged that Boko Haram received finances from domestic actors who oppose President Jonathan and foreign sponsors who wants to see Nigeria divided and Western economic interest attacked. The All Progressive Congress says what is needed to effectively tackle the Boko Haram menace is new and imaginative thinking, instead of sticking to the same old ways of doing things, which is what the federal government's one billion U.S. dollar loan request represents. In a statement issued in Abuja by its National Publicity Secretary, Lai Mohammed, the party says, while no reasonable person will argue against procuring modern weapons and other needs for the military, it is absolutely important to complement the military campaign against Boko Haram with political, social and economic measures. These, according to APC, is against the backdrop of a sustained but failed military campaign to end the crisis which date back to 2009. APC also warned that by continuing to put undue emphasis on military campaign alone, the federal government is signaling a hardening of position, indicating that crisis can only be resolved by a military campaign and foreclosing on negotiation. The party added that unfortunately for the federal government, nowhere in the world has insurgency been defeated purely by military campaign, not even by the world's most powerful militaries. The presidency has washed its hands of the impeachment of former Adamawa state governor, Maratala Nyako. It also insisted that it knows nothing about the impending impeachment of Nasarawa state governor, 
Tanko Almakura. Presidential spokesman Ruben Abati said this in response to a statement issued by General Muhammadu Buhari on the political situation in the country. He described the claims as wild and totally unsustainable while urging Buhari and his allies in the All Progressive Congress to put their house in order. But he suggested that leadership crises and internal contradictions in APC are responsible for what he termed its downward spiral. He insisted that President Jonathan has never recommended or promoted violence as a tool of political negotiation. The World Bank says the disparities between southern and northern parts of Nigeria is on the rise. It specifically says in its newly released Nigeria Economic Report that the Southwest is on the most advantageous position with fewer people while the situation in the Northeast is getting worse. The bank, however, insists that Nigeria has a positive economic outlook aside from recording some progress in poverty reduction. It's the second edition of the Nigeria Economic Report put together by the World Bank. The focus is on microeconomic situation and trends, but a major part of it is devoted to poverty in Nigeria. The bank notes that the country now has a larger and more diversified economy than previously thought. Uh, the size of GDP, uh, which is uh, uh, 2013 equivalent to the U.S. Uh, $509 billion, uh, is, uh, makes Nigeria the 26th largest country in the world and uh, economy in the world, uh, and is 61% 60, higher than, than, in, than the estimate in 2010, which is the base year, than the previous estimate. Uh, all the way to 2013, where the estimate is 89% higher than, than the previous estimate. Uh, the distribution of growth is also much more diverse, with higher contributions for manufacturing and various uh, services relative to previous estimates. Uh, previous estimates assigned the majority of growth, 80% of growth, to trade, agriculture, and to telecommunications. The authors of the report are, however, puzzled that in spite of its size and wealth, Nigeria has a high poverty rate. Particularly of concern to the bank is the gap between the North and the South. Disparities between the North, very, very strong disparities between the South and the North, and particularly the Northeast and Northwest, uh, and that these disparities actually appear to be increasing. Uh, we have poverty rates that range from 16% in the Southwest all the way to 52% in the Northeast. Um, and, and while the, the South and also North Central experienced declines in the poverty rate between 2010-2011 and the, and the, the 2012-2013, the poverty rate actually increased in, North e in the Northeast and it's remained almost unchanged in the Northwest. The World Bank puts Nigeria's unemployment rate at less than 10%, but says underemployment is the real problem. Uh, but most Nigerians are doing something, right? So, so they are technically working. The problem is that a large share of the population is engaged in low productivity, low paying tasks. Uh, there is a, a, a shortage of uh, high productivity jobs. The bank says Nigeria's economic outlook is positive, but wants more attention on improvements in key infrastructure and increased productivity. It also believes that agriculture holds the key to poverty reduction in the northern region alongside improved security, especially in the northeast. And finally, European Union foreign ministers say they believe an arms embargo against Russia needs to be considered after the downing of a Malaysian airline plane widely blamed on pro-Moscow rebels. British Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond said the tragedy happened because of Russian support for the rebels. An EU leaders' summit recommended that the European Union extend its sanctions against Russia and Ukraine figured for their role in the crisis, but the downing of the flights MH17 had changed the situation completely, Hammond said. British Prime Minister David Cameron had called on the EU to adopt tougher phase three sanctions and to halt all arms sales to Russia, citing specifically a French contract for two helicopter carriers worth 1.2 billion euros. And that's the news on the R on Core TV News.
Next news will be an update at 11. Next is Core Digest, segment 2. See you then.